Can you beat Eternal Ring without using magic? Kingsfield was from Software's flagship dark fantasy dungeon crawler, with slow, deliberate combat using swords and sorcery alike. Usually in those games, magic is the sidearm, the supporting attack, or maybe the player could save up their MP for a big explosion on a tough opponent. The main combat, the workhorse, the bread and butter, was the humble melee attack, usually with a sword. My Magic Only series explored what happens when we snub the core combat in favour of spellcasting. But in the PlayStation 2 era, From Software decided to experiment with their formula. El uh, Eternal Ring was their first foray onto the new platform. Not that it was first by much. Jesus, FromSoft! Look how many releases they pumped out in a short time. At least three of them are much beloved by fans too, as far as I know. I have a PAL copy here. Looks like the European release was published by Ubisoft, of all people. Now this box copy is outrageous. Who said fantasies had to be final? Ooh! <laughs> Were they really trying to set up Eternal Bloody Ring as a competitor to the Final Fantasy franchise? Talk about punching above your own weight. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and chalk this up to one copywriter just being a bit cheeky. A cheeky chappy indeed. Eternal Ring is a lighter, more magic-based take on the Kingsfield formula. Think Bloodborne and how that was a different take on the Souls formula. The melee combat of Eternal Ring may as well be forgotten after the early game. It's all about the magic. There's a staggering amount of spell options obtained through a ring crafting system, allowing for creativity on your loadout and elemental choices. The melee weapons are for the most part your last resort, and killing enemies recharges your magic. That's how heavily magic use is encouraged. FromSoft turned their action dungeon crawler combat on its head by making a game that focused on magic instead. We're going to turn the magic only idea on its head and play the magic based game using no magic. Only melee. Now, is it possible? Technically no. There are obstacles and switches that require the player to cast magic, so our stipulation will be that we can open doors and hit switches, but we are not allowed to use magic to fight. Let's just hope there's no enemy that's out of range of all melee attacks. To summarise Eternal Ring's premise, the young king of Hangaria, not Hungary, is a king in name only, with the de facto rulers being a collective of elders they secretly dispatch a team of knights to the Island of No Return, a place where a ring of ultimate power is rumoured to be hidden away. How the knights are supposed to come back with their prize from the Island of No Return is a mystery to me. Great illustrations, however. The head of the king's retinue learns of the elder's plans and in secret sends his son to investigate on his behalf. That's the player. That's us. We arrive on the island, and we'll soon find out why our fisherman friend won't return. But not before we hear some of Eternal Ring's wonderful voice acting. I gotta be gone now. Thanks for the lift. If you're gonna deliver that ladder, you'd be a lot better off doing it before night. You bet I will. We fishermen usually steer clear of this idea. Gotta be hard working for the king, huh? I believe these are the only lines uttered by our hero Kane Morgan in the entire game. And well, Kingsfield 4 came after this game, but you can see why they didn't bother with in-game voice acting again for Kingsfield. Damn, our boy got dragoned. 
dragon, more like Dragon D's people to their dooms. Eternal Ring is a bit nicer than its parent series, giving us a save point right at the beginning of the game, meaning if we die here we don't have to bloody start the game again every time. We encounter our first enemy, a Sagahin? Never known how to pronounce that. What you got? What you got? A jump and a slash that gets me. And a backstep with iframes. Amazing. I love how he does it several times in a row. Get dead. Also very nice how the first enemies in the game have a good chance to drop healing grass and poison heals and gems. More on those later. The early game is melee only for everyone, as we won't find any magic until well into the second dungeon area. These dragonfly enemies are kinda dopey. As far as I know they don't attack, just free XP and gems, if you can get over how annoying they are to hit. At this point I turn off the head bobbing effect when walking, because on the emulated version it was actually doing my head in, so we're gonna be gliding around for the whole game. I realise at this point that enemy backsteps are their big weakness. You can just wait for it, then hit them when they land, repeatedly. So far, so easy, but it's only the first area. A relatively short one, with a passage that opens out into the light of day. This settlement bears the welcoming name of Research Team HQ. Has a nice ring to it, eh? The people are not the friendliest in the world. This chap just blanks me. Hello? Dude, I'm right here. There's not many people on this island. You'd think he'd have some interest in me. No? I, I've got a letter from the king. Our king. Your king. You too? Rude people, man. He looks like the guy on the box art for Evergrace, another FromSoft game developed alongside this one. Coincidence? Ah, finally, yes. Oh, still rude. Yeah, great sleeping position, mate. I'm sure your neck will thank you later. The taciturn chap at the beginning finally arrives at his post and decides I'm worth speaking to. I love how FromSoft couldn't manage or didn't bother to have NPCs moving and interactable at the same time. Let's go and meet the healing bay. She's like the firekeeper of this game, you know? The home base waifu. Oh. You're the new member. You're hurt. Wait here just a second. She even touches you. Wow, man, you just how I like it. I've heard about you from the assistant captain. You're from the mainland. The captain's in some faraway house and just stares at a gem without talking to us. I guess he's moving too much to talk as well. The quartermaster? So. Does he have the same voice actor as the boat guy? Welcome to this miserable island. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Land. We've been expecting you. I'm Evans. Let me take that letter from you. Eventually, this pen pusher takes our royal decree and and our sword. Let me take your sword. I'll put. What the hell? A weapon request form. I have to say, this is the most bureaucracy I've ever seen in a FromSoft game. Hmm? Give you a sword? Alright, here, how about this? The weapon request form gives us a little shitty dagger. The starting sword is actually better, and what's more, you can't progress the game without handing it over. It's so weird. People live here anymore. Resources are excessively abundant. Resources are excessively abundant. Wow, that's some writing all right. It really rolls off the tongue. So, what we do is, we have to bribe this arsehole with the gems we picked up in the starting cave. We buy back our own starting weapon. The asking price is eight gems. Okay, well, it doesn't matter how strong or what element the gems are. A gem is a gem. They are equivalent to one unit of currency in any shop in the game. Any shop? Well, there's, there's two. Shopping time's over. Now we enter the Water Shrine. The second dungeon, I guess. For some white-hot combat. Yeah. Yeah. This is the place that injured and killed members of the research team. This place? 
The place screams first dungeon for babbies. McCrabs and Sagahin don't put up much of a fight. No idea why I let this guy slap me, ran away, then decided, no fuck you, and turned back to kill him. As I murder these crabs, let me point out, the sword is quite fast. There are no weak or strong strikes like Kingsfield. Every melee attack is maximum power with no cooldown. You're free to stab and slash away at will. Stamina isn't a thing either. About the only thing that can increase our damage at this point, save finding new weapons, is levelling up for your combat. I'm not really sure what the point of this plant is. Does it attack? No? Down a level we see a chest teasing us for later, and a red hooded figure fiddling with something in the wall. It's actually my third playthrough of this game, and I confess, I've never noticed this person before. Eventually we arrive, to find the figure has disappeared, and obtain our first magical spell ring. Fireball, of course. Something I never want to use, but Eternal Ring has other ideas. Several doors in the water shrine are frozen over, blocked by ice. We can't progress the game without using our new fireball spell as an icebreaker. So there's our answer, I suppose. No, you cannot beat Eternal Ring without using magic. So I'll have to move the goalposts a bit. Fish and mailed. We switch to our second objective, beating Eternal Ring using only melee in combat. Deeper we go, did that Sagahin just jump right over my head? We find the stairs revealed when we raise the floodgates and proceed to a kind of amphitheatre looking place, a boss looking ass arena. Now from memory I know that the shop up top will disappear once I finish the dungeon, so I go through the trouble of running all the way back up to buy more healing items. This wouldn't be necessary if playing the game normally, as the player can make themselves a heal spell pretty early on, and it's easy enough to restore your MP. But being unable to cast magic ourselves, we need to stock up on healing items whenever we can. So it's still a worthy use of our time to stab any enemies we come across, even low level ones, as the drop rate for gems in general is very high, and every gem equals a heal we can buy. A decent sized heal too. Back at the arena place, Kane encounters a big Sagahin, who's probably not best pleased that we massacred its kind. Boss time. I like that sliding shoulder barge with the water effect. Just circle strafe, stab, and... Oh wow, that was quick. The ring of insight he drops actually increases XP gain, so why would we ever take it off? Beyond the arena, we see a glowing blue key on a pedestal. Taking it earns us a chat with a rambling dragon. This concludes the Water Shrine. Yes, thanks Eternal Ring, I guess we'll just manually walk ourselves back up to the top. But wait, can you hear that bubble sound effect? Like a pot boiling over? This sound effect was from the cutscene, but it's still here. Oh god, make it stop! I can't, even with the sound effects turned off. I guess it's an emulation issue. Never had this issue on a real console and my tiny CRT telly. That's right, I just said telly. Now let's give the research team the good news. I finally opened the floodgate for... Oh. Oh yeah! This is a From Software game. I forgot for a minute. I'm not that sad about the pen pusher or the supply guy dying though. Meanwhile, Mr. Evergrace is making a last stand.
Oh man, he really hit him with the nothing personal kid. You little rats of the elders. Is that the best you can do? What? The best you can do? The best you can do? Amazing. Amazing dialogue. The eternal ring is mine! 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 Oh, the Elden Ring is mine! 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 Oh. So, this guy survives. Everyone else is dead. Everyone else is dead! What about the waifu? No. The monsters. Jesus, I thought she'd be our shrine maiden, our, our firekeeper. But no, not in the PS2 days. I guess the captain set fire to his own house as he left. Surprise contrived burning tree blockade and a werewolf attack. He's got some moves, man. Fortunately, enemies' backdashes are just a massive window to hit them afterwards. With the village clear again, Kane goes to the trouble of giving his new acquaintances a proper burial. That's a nice touch in terms of storytelling, something that gives us a glimpse into the character we're playing as. Obviously he's principled enough to do right by the team, even if he barely knew any of them. There's nothing else for us here, only to leave via the blue key door. We're treated to a save point and a warp pad that takes us to a place called the Forgotten Dias. Christ, what's a dais? Okay. Residing here is an annoying bloke, I think. Submit to me the gems, and I shall bestow upon thee a ring of great power. No, it's not a ring that he gives us, it's the ring crafting system that's central to this whole game. Basically, we can fuse the gems we've been picking up to make rings in a complicated crafting system that various game facts I've read do a terrible job of explaining. The best source of information is actually the game's manual. I don't really know what the point of crafting rings for me is because I won't be firing any spells. Every switch or door but one in this game can be activated by the first fireball spell. So what I do is make a bunch of attribute rings to raise my stats in each element in the hope that this will increase my defence against those elements, i.e. I'll get hurt less by spells that hit me. You'd think there'd be some kind of strength attribute ring you could use to increase your melee damage, but nope. None of the craftable rings do it as far as I know. Another example of how melee combat is actively discouraged in Eternal Ring. So with our possibly useless rings crafted, we set off into the Great Unknown. The worship area is up next. The water looks wild to me. And you know it ain't a FromSoft game without ruins. We stop to observe a lizard. Is this thing peaceful? Well, time to kill it. I actually like how accurate its movements are. Man, these things can take a beating. Finally, a humanoid, weapon-swinging enemy for some classic first-person footsies. I love the noise he makes. That's exactly the noise I'd make if I ever tried to swing a sword in IRL. Something that makes the melee combat in this game easy is that most enemies lack poise and are staggered by each of my hits, making them a lot easier to manage. These butterflies, however, are not easy to manage. I had to heal then. You'll see me heal instantly in this playthrough. That's because I've mapped my golden grass to the select button. The hotbar in this game, as in Kingsfield, isn't a bar, it's just the one button. Man, fuck these things. Why did I waste my time trying to hit them? And time is a-wasting. It's dusk now. 
That's right, this game has a day-night cycle, and it's so unnecessary. It basically adds nothing but annoyance to the game. But I suppose back in the early PS2 days, it was still considered quite impressive. In the central ruin, we're stopped by the red-hooded figure from earlier. Apparently, this place is flooded because of us. He gives us a ring that protects against poison in the valley. Oh. Oh no! Yo, he spelled through like through, with a U. Is that okay? Maybe it's okay. He tells us to avoid the forest and chance it through the Valley of De Poison. Nah, man, we're, we're going for the forest. Hey, what would you choose? A dangerous forest or Blight Town? Before we go, we run back and make a couple more attribute rings. Again, not knowing if they'll help at all, and save the game just in case. You can't sprint in Eternal Ring, but the default walk speed is decently quick. In fact, it's faster than the sprint in Kingsfield 4. We'll need that walk speed for the forest. First up, bees. Can't do anything about that. We can't reach the hive, and probably don't want to either. And of course, we instantly find a save point and ring crafting teleport, making my backtrack completely pointless. I know these lizards will shred me in one hit, so we avoid them. Just run around willy-nilly, looking for a path to the next area. And gave this one a little love tap. But then, my night of hard gaming got the better of me. I was honestly falling asleep as I played. The once... And again here, where I just stood still, asleep at the wheel. And again, this time, a stinky lizard noticed me. I roused myself and went searching again. This time I just stuck to the left and found an incline going up, which leads exactly where we need to be, in humanity's first ever safe space, up a tree. There have been some other visitors to this island of no return. They found sanctuary in the great hollow of this giant tree. A place that looks kind of cool, but really isn't. Through a cloth doorway, through a loading screen, there's a branch sticking out into the void, above the ocean or something. But there's nothing here. Apparently there's no point to it. I seem to remember there being an item, but it's not here now. There are two survivors in this treehouse. One runs a shop where we buy a Cinquedea, which does more damage than our current sword. A whopping two points. Do you know a Mr. Shopkeep asks us to bring him a woman? Lila. Okay, well, the waifu died, so I guess he's not spoiled for choice. He's a mysterious man. His legs disappear into shadow. No, literally, shadow. The other guy's built like a brick shithouse. Brick tells us they had a third member who fell and died, and wants a trinket off his corpse. To sell? No, to send back to the family of the deceased. to find a memento so I could give it to his family back home. This is our base of operations now too, as there's a ring crafting mm, station, I guess, a save point, and a path to the aforementioned Poison Valley. It's not just Miyazaki who loves poison swamps. FromSoft were doing it long before he showed up. True ballers know the original Blight Town was actually Demon Souls Valley of Defilement. A place where all the unwanted filth of Boletaria ended up. Poison. Plague. Pregnancies unwanted. Well, this was heavily implied. Abandoned. Thrown out. Disposed of. And true true ballers know this place in Eternal Ring is named... Disposal Valley. Even so, it's not the first poison swamp in FromSoft history. Yet as far as we're concerned, it's one of the most annoying. See. The intended way to tackle this area would be to craft an antidote ring with our water gems. Couple this with the protection spell given by the hooded man earlier, and you'll be poisoned less often and able to cure it when it happens. For us, we'll just have to live with it. We have antidote items, but what's the point if we're immediately reinfected anywhere in this area? That even includes the caves where we're not actually standing on the poison so we endure a lot of HP loss and a constant green flashing. Fortunately, the enemies aren't tough. 
more lizards, as in four-legged lizards, not the humanoid ones. On our first pass, we find the exit quickly, and a dragon lurking in the area below. He's not friendly looking, but neither is the ledge I drop down to try and talk to him. We go splat. On the second pass, we stay in the valley to explore, and find more annoying butterflies. It's very easy to get lost in this place. The design isn't particularly memorable, and the longer we stay here, the more healing grass we burn through. An easily missable corpse in a large chamber belonged to the third member of the Tree Boys TM. We take the trinket old Brick was asking for. He gives us something in return, but the game doesn't tell us what it is. So if you haven't memorized your inventory, an inventory you may at this point have filled with all kinds of crafted rings, it's quite hard to figure out what it is he gives you. I'm looking at the footage now, and I don't know anymore. Oh well, I'm sure it wasn't important. So let's craft some more rings, for whatever good it will do us, and go shop it. The guy's asleep! Hey wake up man, I need to buy some herbs! What the hell? Other than the look of some areas, this is the only way the day-night cycle actually affects us, and it's annoying. It's basically stopping our progress. <sighs> Let's just go, and hope we don't run out of healing grass. The Limestone Cave. This way lies progress, and I've always found it confusing as all hell. The lion's share of Eternal Ring takes place in a long sequence of areas, mostly linear. We meet a wizard. Well, sorry mate, we're not doing magic only anymore. Let me introduce you to the power of the sword. Man, this guy just doesn't care. I must have hit him about 15 times to no avail. Power of the sword indeed. We'll take on his lesser minions instead. That's more our speed. Oh god, we've been hit by a spell, and now suffer from the curse status ailment, which reduces our attack. I foolishly take on this steel golem enemy, but the curse mercifully wears off by this point. Not so bad, killing him only took 23 stabs. The reward in the chest was just a higher level firestone. Nothing to write home about. Moving on. Except we don't, because I got lost and ended up at the beginning again. Did I mention this game has no maps at all? Oh, three golems this time. Let me just swipe this blank slate's magic ring. No need to fight. <laughs> well, you know me, I'm going to fight all three of these things, and it's going to take ages. These orcs seem simpler, but they're not. We're now in a shit slinging contest. These are hard to avoid, and they have a melee attack too. That's something I find enjoyable about this challenge, actually. Every enemy is a little puzzle to figure out. What's their attack pattern? What's the play? How do I get hit less? How do I get in and hit them? Well, here's my best answer for the slingers. Strafe to the side and move in after their throw. Repeat to avoid the melee swipe. As you can see though, my execution is a bit lacking. This is probably the hardest part of the game so far. The slingers are now up on raised platforms, pelting me from above. Look at this hell room. Combining clubbers, slingers... Is this Age of Empires 1? I don't need to kill everything, but I want to, man. The barbarian in me is dying for attention after the last few magic videos. Come here, you little. Oh, he fell down. Come on. Man, I am taking a beating out here. Meanwhile, Mr. Evergrace is sitting on a rock. Again. He just loves rocks, apparently. He tells us the now deceased research team was here looking for the Eternal Ring. Okay, no big revelation there. A people known as the Solsians used to own it on this island, but they were wiped out for reasons unknown. He also tells us there's another magic user besides us on the island, some lady called Lila. Off he goes, and we've got no choice but to watch him slowly strut around the corner. Of 
course he's gone. Oh, he must have started sprinting as soon as he was out of sight. Classic. He's led us to the next area, but instead we take a one-way passage back to the tree hideout to see if we can get a secret weapon. I'd read online at this point that you can find a stiletto, a, a dagger, not a single high heel. Calm down, you lot. It's a better weapon and apparently deals some elemental damage. While the vendor's getting more beauty sleep, I can open the crate he's usually guarding. Except it's empty. I don't know if I screwed myself out of the stiletto by speaking to him earlier or something. I actually went through two more day-night cycles, hoping I could find the weapon later, but no joy. So let's just wait till daytime and get the consolation prize. He hands us a rapier, which is an upgrade on physical damage, it just has no elemental bonus damage. While we're here, we have another go at the forest. And nope. No, nope, clearly not ready yet. We are ready for the Mine Ruins. Wonderful technology here. The lifts go up with no apparent mechanism powering them. The island is suffuse with magic, which confuses our thick barbarian skull, so we take it out on some rats. Come here. They do attack with their own spells, but usually from a distance. You plague-ridden rats! Spells? Magic? <laughs> stabby, stabby, slashy, slashy. They drop nice sparkly gems though, and pretty flowers and all. These golems are apparently controlled by the levitating wizards. They break down as soon as the pilot dies. This section involves floating platforms that move agonizingly slowly, which would be fine if not for the floating wizards attacking on some of the rides. I was genuinely scared at this point, but fortunately they aim at you with a straight shot, so any amount of lateral movement by the platform means we won't get hit. Unless they fire at point blank. Hey, you just, you just killed his mate. After ascending to the top, we're already done with the mines and moving on to the production lines. The iron mill contains more puny magic users. <laughs> This'll be a breeze. Except it won't. These swordsmen keep us busy. They've got a whole move set. Here you can see me experimenting, looking for a way to hit him with impunity. I figured maybe I could outspace the lunge by backstepping, but I take a step too far. The backstep works. Oh no, he's muted me, so now I can't cast spells. Oh well. In this room, there's a bunch of rats together in a tight space. Oh no. They're gonna get tangled up and become a rat king. Don't look that up. Seriously, you have been warned. I wonder where that Evergrace looking chap got to. Oh, there he is. He is super dead. <laughs> yeah, what a surprise. There's a diary entry here about the Solcian people the original caretakers of this island, I believe. They were all turned into dragons by some evil. So, that dragon chatting nonsense at us earlier was actually a human. Let's open this door and, man, paralyzed on entry. Now we creep slowly towards every enemy so we can stab them. We've become a Tonberry now. Oh boy, do I really want to take on two of these swordsmen at once? The answer is, of course, yes. But in close quarters, they mash me up, so I run, and luckily they give chase, into a nice long room where I can get them stretched out again. Still, it was a tough fight. The top floor reveals a weird set of moving platforms and levers. I drop down to these crates and find the whole place is golem powered. I hit that ass for a while until I got tired. I don't think this golem can be stopped. Ugh, it walked right through me. Back up top we ride one platform to another switch which opens the floodgates, allowing lava to pour through. But to what end? 
I legit forgot what I'm supposed to do, but after dropping down, we can see that the red key has dropped in the middle of the room. What a terrible place to drop it. If I'd approached from the other side, I wouldn't have been able to see it because of that little bridge thing. Through the red key door, we find... Man, look at this boss-ass room. It's the captain from earlier. What the? Is he a Jojo character? What's with this pose and movement? You disgust me. I don't know, mate. You're the one with the weird legs. Not to body shame you, but I'm quite normal. No one escapes the circle of death. The circle strafe of death. We used to say that playing Medal of Honor Frontline Multiplayer. And yes, I just stood here stabbing him repeatedly while barely moving. I get the feeling that FromSoft weren't expecting players to go melee only. Going melee only certainly has its drawbacks, as this ogre kindly shows us. I can't complain that the enemies are tanky though. The game wasn't balanced around melee, after all. For a river of liquid magma, this place sure is dark. Let's light it up with a forbidden fireball. The second set of doors which require magic to open. Something I've found with games in general is that one enemy is typically easy to deal with. Several of the same enemy is a bit harder, but combine different enemy types in one group, now you have a problem. Or you have some fun. Kiting the group, isolating easier targets, I'm taking out the bombs here and avoiding the hatchet man. They help me with some friendly fire and we take them out. Only to meet the unfriendly fire of this bird. I gave up hitting him very quickly. <laughs> Stabby go boom! After Stabby go boom, I meet the Red Arima from Ghosts and Goblins. Red Arima. Matthew D. Ross the Third. Come on, man! Random name generator, circa 2001. He says he's the king of somewhere, but that's only because he's been down the gym. This is the ideal male body. You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. Oh no! Hurry, this way. Wow, he really fired a second breath to really make sure the perfect male body was dead. Misandrist. Anyway, Lila saves us. It's our first time meeting this fabled woman. You know she's magical if she's cute and has symbols on her face. Wait, she's a sorcerer too? Is she a magic pixie dream girl? I oh, know that's wrong, shut up. Father, it's me, Lila. Please calm down. Oh, Dad, the dragon's her dad. Dad dragon? Good thing we protected in this bubble. Oh, what the fuck? We come to in the magic laboratory. With the only path back up being a steep climb, we're stuck here for now. We may as well explore then and chase this rat. Get back here. I wasn't trying to fight a boss, but I walked through this door and found what I can only describe as a giant nightmare chicken. Damn, he's got moves too. But we'll see who rules the roost around here. I got pecked! My goodness. Yes, I stabbed chicken butt in my spare time. Come on, four eyes, I'm over here. If you ever wondered why first person melee combat is never as popular as third person, maybe this boss footage says it all.
Dead chicken, dead gem. We could leave, but there's more to explore. Four plinths face each other across the central void, each with a slot for the different element keys. Interacting with one without placing a key warps you to some unseen corridor within the lab. We meet another stabby swordsman and find useless loot like dragon eggs for restoring the MP we're not using. This door blows up in my face, thanks to the acrobatic tribesman behind it. Apparently, he's invincible for the whole of his backflip. Jeez, I've met my match here. Stand still. Nice. God, I hope the other room doesn't have another one of those guys. Ha! We try the blue plinth and encounter another new enemy, some kind of chimera lion head, and a goat's head coming out of its back. Remember this thing for later. His slash does some damage to us, the spell launched by the goat head does more damage, and while he's not a big threat, I've run out of my standard healing grass, leaving only the golden flower heals, which are rarer. I start to worry here because there's no way back and we're running low on resources. This is something that wouldn't happen were we allowed to use magic. Without the other two elemental keys, there's nothing more to be done in the lab for now, so we pass through the boss room and reach the next area. The old battleground by night. I assume this is where most of the fighting between the Solsians and the invading Aldine army happened. Immediately we're set upon by two werewolves and our healing woes get much worse. Two at once is a problem. After a tough fight, I realise with horror that the airborne enemies here will not come down to earth, so we have no way to hit them. Their arrows fly straight and true. This place sucks, even when playing normally, because I swear those arrows can go through walls as well. Yeah, right here. With so much damage dealt by werewolves, magical dogs, wall-banging archers, I started to panic and decide to just leg it. Running around like a headless four-eyed chicken takes us to the exit. To safety? Not on your life. Certainly not safety for my ears. I've reduced the volume here because the emulation had bugged out, I think. Did my appearance surprise you? I used to work for the king of Al God, I listened to his whole dialogue without wanting to load my save. Does this guy have intestines for a jacket? Well, our new friend decides he's gonna just sit here and wait for death. Maybe this is an improvement on the usual FromSoft NPC. I mean, usually they don't choose. He tells us Lila is actually related to us. Great, that adds nothing to the story. Also, do you think Lila is named after Lyle from Kingsfield 3? We save and reload and that gets most of the audio issues? We then encounter the unique aspect to the library area. There are six rooms on each floor, some lazy symmetrical level design. Each room contains a gargoyle, minding its own business, until we come along and start poking. He pokes me back with his toenails. The learning process for this guy involves getting kicked repeatedly in the mush. Pro plays. You have to kill three gargoyles to activate one of the elevators up to the next floor. Oh look, a hole! Well that was smart. Now I have to kill the gargoyle again. But not before I chuck myself down the hole once more. With feeling this time. No, even with full health it's a guaranteed death. The tactic I worked out for the gargoyles is another back step to outspace their attack then return the favour by cutting those long toenails. To death! With the pedicure punishment performed, we can head upstairs. Head upstairs for some fairy fun. I spent a long time trying to kill this thing, but it's hard to hit. Must have a really small hitbox, and its flight is erratic. So I killed one, it dropped nothing, and I gave up after a while. Back downstairs, we stab more gargoyle feet, and look at that door! I can see it poking out the top of the wall. On the other upstairs section, we encounter the seemingly invincible mages once again. Well, last time it didn't work, but I'm gonna try and stab him again. Stupid fucking wizards. And look up his skirt. 
He can't hit me for whatever reason, and they're not so tough anymore. With almost no healing items left, I shouldn't be taking on two of these guys at once, but I've got the gamer bloodlust, so here we go. I tried to rush one down while the bookcase protects me from the other one's spells. It worked for the most part. Now it's time to pull this switch and leave. The game doesn't tell you exactly what you achieve by pulling said switch, but it activates another lift in that hole we fell down earlier. There's actually nothing in the basement save a gargoyle we just ignore. We choose instead to press on. I want to get back to safety so I can buy more healing grass. Pressing on takes us to these ruins on a cliff. We can talk to an NPC and progress the story here, but instead we take the detour of all detours. The warp pads found throughout the game are now activated, although I'm not sure what caused that. This one takes us back to the Poison Valley, so we can get lost and green all over again. But the benefit of warping is we're a hop, skip and a jump away from the tree hideout and the all-important merchant, who is asleep again so now I have to wait around before I can buy any heals. To kill time I head back to Research Village, now a ghost town. The red key we picked up earlier can open locked doors back in the Water Shrine. Our prize for such backtracking and searching? Sweet fuck all. Nothing worthwhile, nothing useful. Other than the gift of time passing. Does anyone think of time passing as a gift? Well in the daytime we can finally stock up on a truckload of healing items, a combined 60 grass. We also make more rings for I don't know what, I just hope it'll help on our special journey. There's some endgame content in Eternal Ring, a bonus dungeon, four floors of hell. It's located at the beach at the very beginning of the game. The door is locked and will only open to a light or dark spell, something you can only make if you've progressed at least as far as we have. The first enemies aren't so scary, running rats, cornered and skewered. Next up, another werewolf. This one's not quite as forgiving as the others. He killed me in one hit from full health. This tells us that we are severely under leveled to be here. It's really end game content. However, the reward we'll get if we can navigate this dungeon is worth the risk, the time, and the headache. Taking a cue from the rats, we copy their strategy, and instead of fighting the wolves, we just run. I'm gonna run the whole dungeon, so here we go. This place is labyrinthine. I'll admit, dear viewer, I definitely looked up some maps, especially as the second floor is a literal maze. It's quite a cool dungeon if played normally, by the way. There's lots of little variations on enemies you've seen before, like this invisible rat, whom I can't seem to get rid of. It's like no matter what direction I turn, he's still running ahead of me. The giant plants are nerve-wracking too. You never know what could be lurking behind. So if you know the way, if you're a filthy cheater like me, you'll finish floor two quickly enough. Floor three is where things get a bit dicey, or icy, I guess. A cold reception indeed. Now it's like Kingsfield, with the same texture on the floor and walls. Even with a map I got lost. Until these lizard boys froze me in my tracks. I couldn't squeeze past. Undeterred, we try again. Back through the first floor, chasing rat ass again. Back here. Get back here! Oh, it's the boss enemy! This is the salty run back, because I'm salty, and I'm running back, through the bushes. When we meet the lizard blockade again, I'm hit by pride missiles coming through the wall. Nice eternal ring, nice. With a bit of juking, we finally slip past, euthanize a cold boy, and slip to the final floor. The fourth and final floor is a series of optional mini-bosses. First up, Another Chimera Lion thing. I was terrified at this point. I assume taking a hit from that dark projectile will just delete me. 
I go for the old circle strafe and stab, but he slashes back, dealing next to no damage. This really surprised me. I don't know why it's so physically weak. Fortunately, I never found out how much damage its spells did. Our Chimera friend drops the Kaiser Knuckle, an incredibly strong knuckle duster. This is half the reason we came here. Our strength rating jumps from 34 to 114. Let's go punch this Sagahin. Seriously, I think this is a I think this is a joke. A bright white version of the first weakest enemy in the game. I'd laugh if it hits like a truck. Sadly, I never found this out either because I'm now one punch man. Wait, no I'm not. I'm machine gun punch man. Our saggy friend dropped the animated sword ring, which lets us attack super rapidly. Very animated. We can now aura aura our way to victory. Between us and the exit, however, is the optional super boss of Eternal Ring. Well, guess what? The exit teleport is active, so we just run past. Safe with our prize. I got my fast nuts. I didn't want to risk it. It's almost game over at this point. We're insanely powerful now, but I want revenge on the dungeon that tortured me for a good couple of hours. It's time to test this bad boy out. <laughs> nice floating rock. Punchy, punchy, punchy. Why isn't this weapon set up in Dark Souls, man? Time for my revenge on Teen Wolf. Urgh! I'm drunk with power at this point, doing it for fun, but the werewolves aren't quite as amused. So I'm in total glass cannon mode. I can dish it out but I still can't take it. Time to go back in. I'm intent on besting this dungeon now with my fists of fury, but they do have their drawbacks. The range on this fist weapon isn't great. Who'd have thought it? Apparently my arch nemesis is once again the humble rat, impervious even to my greatest weapon. But there's a weapon greater still, and this is our current goal. Heh, <laughs> glass jaw bucket of bolts. Reaching the frozen floor is easy, and look at this badass man. Cool enough design, but one by one, they all must fall. We meet and beat the rainbow boss chicken again, and every time I give that angry bird a thrashing, I seem to level up. I waded through the salvo of spells, spamming heel grass to get in and pluck him. He goes down, and a lizard tries to flank me. I'd just turned to administer a few swift jabs to the lizard when I instantly died. Wow, instant death. I'm still not sure what killed me. It seems like there was a little flash of electricity before it happened, so maybe it was the same type of lizard that killed me earlier. Once again, I ran through the dungeon, because once I'd seen that every chicken kill nets me a level, I couldn't forget it. What follows is some good old fashioned grinding. Here's the route. I enter the icy floor, kill a lizard in self-defense, punch a rooster to boost up my level, and go back to the teleporter to reset the floor. I could have spent a long time doing this, as the rate of EXP gain was massive. However, I got bored and only gained 9 levels total. Perhaps feeling a bit cocky, I decided to press on and face the quote-unquote super boss. But not before I met my lizard pals and tried to steamroll them. Apparently level 33 was just enough because they damn near killed me with their projectiles. One HP! Jesus. Also, once again there's a chicken somewhere providing fire support through the wall. To reach the boss on the final floor we must descend these painful stairs. Don't you love that in video games where you take damage upon entering a boss arena? It's not that bad here, but I'm looking at you, Nito. So the boss is a golden skull armor dude, surrounded by six of those annoying wizards. I imagine this would be a problem if playing like a normal magic user, but not for Roll Punchy. With the mages mercilessly mashed, it's time to deliver a knuckle sandwich to Golden Boy. Once again, we enter the circle, strafe, of death. I always seem to go right, maybe because I'm right-handed. 
I think his bird familiar absorbs spells, so that's moot. He has a sword combo that fires a direct spell projectile, which is easily avoided. An important thing is none of my hits stagger him, so I can't stay in the pocket. So it's strafe, avoid the spell, move in, and deliver four to six punches, and back out again. You know what else is back out? His life. Cause, cause he, cause he's dead. There's, the life, isn't in the body anymore. It's out. It's back. Yeah. So he drops what looks like a terrible knockoff moonlight sword. What is this thing? Eternal sword. It's horrible. Horrible though it may be, it's the best weapon in the game, and combined with the animated sword ring we're wearing, we go from punchy punchy to stabby stabby at almost the same rate. Now it's time to just fuck everything up. Like fucking up my own precious time by finally exploring the forest, long after anything useful could have been found here. At least not for a pure melee player. So. There's Lizard Swordsman, whom I now annihilate instantly. At some point, the boys chase me down. We meet them head on. The game has turned into a magical slasher flick now, except I'm the slasher. Emerging from the mist, stab happy. Very happy. So to return to the main game, we need to traverse the Valley of Shite once again. We get lost for the umpteenth time, until we find the warp pad back to the windmill place. This time we open a door to finally have a one-to-one -one with Lila. A tete-a-tete -tete -tete that doesn't result in us being blasted into a hole by a dragon. Lila talks to us for an eternal time, and we read a book on the table. The summary of both is as follows. You're from Sasha. The island used to host an advanced magical civilization. They made an artificial god-being called Soulless. Immortal. All-powerful. However, he's essentially a psychopath, or worse. The being didn't have any feelings at all. He would destroy whole cities on a whim, with no concept or understanding of neither death nor suffering. The way you or I might swat a fly or crush an ant, with no second thought. The ancients trapped Soulless inside the Eternal Ring. That's what the Eternal Ring is, a prison for this god-being. Later, the Solstian people invaded the island seeking power for their war efforts. They broke the ring open, and the god changed them into dragons and monsters for fun. The old guardians managed to seal the ring again, but it's weakening, and soon Solus will escape and do whatever he pleases. Lila herself is the last of the Solsians, and she repeatedly visits this god, Solus, to try and teach him how to feel, to try and bestow the gift of empathy. I suppose the god has a wee bit of indigestion, as the earth starts rumbling, and Lila runs off, but not before uttering the classic NPC advice, stay right there. <laughs> yeah lady, sure. We follow her, I think into an underground lake, where we meet another shit-chatting dragon. Eventually, it decides to spend the last of its MP to speak English to us, using one of the worst choices of font and colour I've ever seen. He tells us that Lila's efforts to teach emotion to the god-being will be futile, and that we can find the Eternal Ring back in the magic laboratory once we have all four keys. Beyond the lake waits the Tower of Storms, and its interesting lighting, and its banger of a track. Old FromSoft composers went hard, man. It's a cool experience. We rush up floor after floor, barely stopping to indulge in the wanton slaughter of anything even close to being in our way. Some winged enemies are free from our wrath, however. Yes, I said wrath. I don't like it either. Those of you who know the game have perhaps been waiting for this moment. Other than needing spells to open doors, this is the moment where the idea of playing melee only will meet its hardest test yet. 
Awaiting us atop the tower is an aggressive airborne adversary. The straight-up dragon does what dragons do. It flies. Obviously the player is expected to fight Calamite's grandad using spells. We can't hit it. This is what I've always been worried about when it comes to this playthrough. I tried various things, like standing across the roof, hoping I could lead the dragon towards me and within striking range. No joy. I figured this was the end of the playthrough. Without magic, we can't kill this dragon diver. I thought about either giving up or making an exception just to finish the game. All his attacks are ranged. If he just did one melee attack, maybe I could trade hits, but he doesn't even swoop past. The only thing he swoops past is the tower itself. After every appearance, he dive bombs. This is where I got my second idea. I wonder how close he gets when he dives past. Stepping forward onto the very edge of the roof, I try my luck. And holy shit, it looks like my knockoff Moonlight Blade actually connected. I saw the hit effect. This is it. This is the strat. We repeat the process, edge forward carefully, and start slashing. He's dead. And so is the game, apparently. The game itself had its mind blown by my genius, and this horrendous audio glitch persists until I can run back through the tower to save and shut the damn thing off. The run is saved, and melee only will continue. Our elusive foe, the dragon, dropped the green key when he died. It opens a door in the tower and reveals a warp pad to a snowy area. We barely enter before some werewolf talks to us. He was a human, is now trapped in this form, and has been for 20 years. Enough time for his mother to pass on. Well, we press on, and make more monsters pass on. While our rage is unabated, the game is starting to feel like a foregone conclusion at this point. This harpy knows what's good for it, and circles overhead. Scraping its beak against the rocks, apparently but it never lands, and therefore gets to keep its miserable life. The Great Snow Monkey Massacre of 2022 happens, all caught on camera by that harpy, which is actually a drone operated by a UN watchdog. So when I tell the world I was only hosting snow monkey re-education camps and only arresting the criminal element within them, it's an outright lie, and I was perpetrating snow monkey genocide. I suppose the challenge the player must overcome to earn the Earth Key is simply navigating the area, as there's no boss keeping us from picking it up. Our werewolf bard makes a funny gesture before saying anything. You will become like me if my mother were. We now have all four keys. It's time to progress to the end game. Back in the magic lab, we insert all four keys into the uh, plinths, keyholes, which raise blocks. Turning keys, building bridges, for a magic free tomorrow. Mage builds a scum. You heard it here first. So, we're finally able to descend the staircase and see what's hidden within the magic lab. It's a floating platform that leads to... that leads to... the forgotten dais? And this guy, again? Oh, more spiel. I'll spare you the details. He says nothing interesting. No matter how many interesting comes from Lila, inside the Eternal Ring, speaking to Soulless, the god. Or rather, the child god. This being that raised cities to the ground, slaughtered thousands, turned all the army into random dragons just for funsies, is this emotionless child. Lila is desperately trying to explain emotions to something that can't feel. The child also has a fascination with baby birds. Lila valiantly tries to explain the concept of death through the medium of baby birds, but the child god isn't having any of it. There are many seabirds that 
can be used as replacements. That may be weird. He appears to like Lila, however. She seems to have a maternal role. We're privy to this just before entering the final area, the Eternal Dimension. It looks like some part of the island was ripped out of its time and space to serve as a prison for the child god. More mages casting slow on us, more Tonberry treatment. We make our way towards Lila, slaughtering anything that dares stand in our path. We encounter a Skull Knight, and I marvel at the badassery. Enough to just stand and take what he's dishing out. Wow, he took all those stabs like a champ. Healy, healy, healy. Stabby, stabby, stabby. But wait, who's that on the floor? No, not yet. Child, he isn't ready. I still have much to teach him. Did you forget? Did you forget this is from software? After taking a second to mourn and look up Lila's skirt a bit, it's time to see who did this. Oh, it's this twat. He can't even talk anymore. All he says is ring. Well, we're gonna tear his open. Or maybe not. He's the first thing to threaten us in a good long while. And he's throwing Geese Howard replicants at us? Double replicants! So the strat I came up with quickly was wait for him to land, then eat some projectiles to get in and trade damage, and that's that. The sound glitch happens again, so I opt to run all the way back to a save point, back through the final area again. As it used to say on cans of Relentless, the energy drink, suffer for your art. The save point, by the way, is past the Forgotten Deus. I have to ride the moving platform again and make the return journey back to the late Lila riding the moving platform again. At long last, we arrive back where we killed the demonic captain and come face to face with Solus, the child god. Despite all his power and intelligence, he still doesn't understand the concept of death. Or does he? They say he has no emotions. I'm pretty sure he's experiencing anger right now. Is Lila's death what it took to finally impart the knowledge? Let me out. The kid attacks. Yes, the final boss of Eternal Ring is a floating big head baby in a sphere. I can't say I'm too surprised. Looking at you, Half-Life. His prison is pretty cool. Not that we're here long. Even the child god can't stand up to our ugly sword. To borrow his own terminology, he soon stops moving. It's strange to see the being that wrought so much destruction that was so feared simply drop to the ground, barely more than a fetus. The game lingers looking at him for a while too like it wants us to feel it. Kane takes one last look before setting off on his journey home. But the child god is not so easily undone, not even by multiple stab wounds from a sword bigger than him. The child is confused and goes to ask his only guide and role model, Lila, who is of course dead. What follows is one of the strangest, most awkward monologues I have ever seen in a video game. With the predictably bad voice acting that only serves to enhance how unsettling this scene is. A scene which, in my opinion, redeems the whole story. I'm going to just let this one play. Come on, Layla. How long have you been lying there? I got out all by myself. Will you tell me about the baby birds? Are you mad? Are you mad at me? Lila, please talk to me. Please, Lila. This, this feeling. Ah. Yeah. 
I get it. This is. This is death. So it takes Lila's death to bestow the gift of emotion to the child. This understanding causes him to instantly mature physically as well, with his voice dropping mid-sentence. This is death. Put yourself in my shoes the first time I played this on PS2, by the glow of a CRT television late at night. My thoughts were, holy shit. Now the ending. The events on the island caused the elders to lose power, and through Kane's report and his help, the king consolidates his rule. The interesting part comes next. Once things had settled down, Kane Morgan departed for an unknown destination. But a few years later, he returned to Hungaria, accompanied by a man of unknown identity. King Ian welcomed Kane's return, honoring him with a new position as head of his retinue. And as Kane requested, the king treated the man of unknown identity as one of his vassals. Kane and the man remained loyal to King Ian, and the ruler's name is now recorded in history as that of a skillful and compassionate leader. The man who had arrived in Hungaria with Kane left following the death of King Ian, but it is said that time itself, not even the passing of decades, could change his appearance. So, just in case you're having trouble following, Soulless strangely elongated head fits nicely in that turban. As far as good endings go in FromSoft games, this one is better than usual. Kane obviously picks up where Lila left off, providing counsel and wisdom to Solus. Although what happened to his great power, I wonder? Thanks for watching. My final thoughts on this challenge are that it's certainly a thing that I did. Next up, a place of high altitude and low light. And as always, we'll meet again someday soon.